Hello, welcome to a 2021 revision update video looking at the important theory of contestable markets. Many of you in your year 13 economics will have been studying market structures and competition between suppliers. This theory of contestable markets is hugely important and is tested regularly by exam boards, often because it's very topical. There's loads of good examples we can think about. Hopefully this video will give you some good definitions, some good examples before we move on to the analysis and then the evaluation. A contestable market is defined, I think, best as when a new market entrant has equal access to the prevailing production technologies and techniques. Uh, in other words, they have the same access to the technologies and things that the existing or the incumbent firms, the established firms have. They're not prohibited from wooing. I love that word, wooing the incumbent's customers. In other words, they're not prohibit prohibited from trying to gain some market share, perhaps with a new product or a new marketing technique. And crucially, as you will see, a contestable market is where entry decisions, the decisions to enter a new market or sub-market, can be reversed without cost, without significant cost. In other words, the, the sunk costs are pretty low. So what are the main characteristics of a highly contestable market? Well, crucially, is the absence of sunk costs. And we will look at sunk costs in a second or two. Sunk cost is a cost that you have to incur if you enter a market and things don't go as well as you thought. And uh, so it's like a leaving cost or an exit cost. Equal access to technologies and also having sufficient market information about uh, customer preferences and things is also quite important. Uh, it's easier to enter a market if there is weak brand loyalty. In other words, there's a higher level of customer churn, which means that people are willing and able to switch supplier um, oftentimes in a market, consumers may have locked themselves into contracts, for example, and that can make a market less contestable. Overall, a market is contestable if the barriers to entry are fairly low and also the market, the exit costs are low. Which leads us on to this question, what are sunk costs? Now, in a contestable market, the sunk costs are low. Sunk cost is a business cost that cannot be recovered in whole or in part if a business decides, chooses to leave an industry, perhaps close down production. They've made an investment into a market, it hasn't worked out, and they decide to leave. Now, when sunk costs are high, a market becomes less contestable. Are there are the costs associated with leaving a market. For example, you may have to conduct a fire sale of your assets. Uh, items of capital, for example, that are specific to a particular industry. And if you have a fire sale, typically the price that you sell at goes down because you have to sell. The buyer knows that and they can negotiate a, a hefty discount. It could be that you leave a market and you have, you have some unsold stock. And again, you have to try and have a fire sale to eliminate uh, stocks to raise a little bit of cash, perhaps. Another aspect which is slightly more intangible is if you leave a market, you might leave your customers in the lurch. They might have bought your product and they want to continue using it, but you've left the industry and therefore the after sales service isn't quite as good or the supply of replacement parts. So you may well lose goodwill and perhaps the, your customer loyalty takes a hit, particularly if you try and branch out into other markets. Are there good examples of markets that have become more contestable uh, in recent times? Well, the answer is yes, and they're typically chosen by exam boards because there's a lot of interesting economics that you can ask about them. So from food retailing, for example, the rise of the deep discounters, Aldi and Lidl, who are now taking something like 13 to 15 percent of UK grocery market share and are a significant threat, competitive threat to the likes of Sainsbury's and, and uh, Asda and Tesco. The fast food sector has lots of new entrants. Obviously, firms come and go. The arrival of five guys into the market and other, other, other uh, businesses uh, trying to challenge the dominance of Burger King and KFC and Mackey's. Airbnb has been a major challenger and disruptor to the existing hotel sector. And of course, increasingly in the cities and the towns in which you might live, you might now have a choice of uh, transport apps, including Uber, Lyft and others. The market for shaving products for many, many years has been dominated by Chic and Gillette. Uh, but increasingly, there are some other products arriving on the market uh, trying to enter 
perhaps with a, d a discount deal. We'll look at that market in a second. Book selling's become more contestable. Amazon is now launching book shop, uh, bookstores in their own right. Um, a lot of people are now self-publishing, publishing their books. Um, uh, the retail energy market is becoming more contestable, as we'll see in a few minutes. The big six have lost market share to some new entrants, many of whom focus on renewable energy. And there's also been a lot of lot more competition these days in, in freight. Here's a picture of Uber. Uber has entered the freight market. And a huge amount more competition in the market for parcel deliveries and other logistics services. So quite a few good examples. Here's, here's one we might just focus on for a couple of minutes. It's the, it's the kind of razor market. Typically, razors are sold at quite a high price, a premium price. The, the, the price elasticity on is pretty low. And if you're a wet shave user, you're going to need a razor. Uh, and uh, I mean, if, this is the market data for the United States in 2019. And can you see here that uh, Gillette has something like seven of the top 10 market brands in terms of razor sales in the United States? And so they, they clearly dominate the market. In many ways, Gillette saturates the market with different types of, of razors. I know some razors might even offer free Wi-Fi along the way. Well, interestingly, Harry's has broken that market. So it's quite interesting to see the, the rise of uh, things like Dollar Shave Club and Harry's razors. So it is possible to enter the market and take, take market share. That said, you're up against some pretty big beasts in the jungle. So Gillette is a brand owned by Procter & Gamble. And what I've done here is just provide a little A to Z of some of their big customer facing brands from aerial washing up liquid to washing powder to whatever to Crest toothpaste to uh, head and shoulder shampoo, seven sieves, cod liver oil and Vicks vapor rub. Procter & Gamble is a ubiquitous, enormous multinational multi-brand firm. You might ask the question, well, how can a new firm compete with a business that's as scaled as Procter & Gamble and other businesses like Unilever? Well, the answer is they can, and, and they do. You know, firms enter markets. New products are, in many ways, the lifeblood of a contestable market. So you might well be familiar with this kind of emerging sectors in, in um, plant-based foods, Alpro and sweetened yoghurt. A lot, of, a lot of activity in the food nutrition sector at the moment. Gray's has done well, a UK startup firm just been bought out. Uh, you may have you tried these nutrition bars like Grenade, Carb Killers and Dairy Free Ice Cream, etc. A lot of those fast moving consumer goods sectors, food and drink uh, is where you often get emerging brands testing the water to see what they can do. A couple of examples just to finish with. Uh, here's the energy market, the electricity and electricity supply market in the UK since 2010. Now, British Gas has the largest market share of any of the big six. But can you see that the share of the big six energy companies has seen a notable decline in recent times? Um, you know, British Gas is one example, uh, so, but, but the market share has now fallen to around 70 percent. Uh, actually, SSE has actually bought Ovo Energy, which is one of the emerging challenger brands. Uh, so it's it's continuing to sell energy, but under the SSE brand for the moment. So this is a good example of an industry which used to be almost completely dominated by six firms. But now you're starting to see more contestability as some new energy suppliers come, come to town. Another good example is probably uh, Internet Service Provider. I'm recording this before my Wi-Fi goes down. It's an oligopoly in the sense that Virgin Media... Sky and BT last year had 69% of the market. Talk Talk was fourth. But can you see there? There are other brands. Uh, now TV, Plusnet, Vodafone. 3% of people don't know who their ISP is. But this is an interesting example. You see you have some big dominant firms. Equally, there is still room for other firms, perhaps, perhaps, to enter the market. So that is contestable markets examples what we'll do in the next quick video is contrast contestable markets with perfect competition